Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video series where we talk about some essential topics of linear algebra. Indeed, in today's part 49, we start talking about the important singular value decomposition for matrices. This is one of the most important matrix decompositions because it's very general and it can be used in a lot of applications. However, it's definitely not the simplest matrix decomposition you can think of and therefore we will use the next videos as well to explain all the details of the singular value decomposition. So in this video I want to give you the idea and overview over the singular value decomposition and then we can go to explicit calculations. However, as always, before we start, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget, with your Steady membership you have access to a lot of additional material like books, PDF versions and quizzes. And then without further ado, let's immediately start by stating the general matrix decomposition as we have discussed it in the last videos. So you know we start with the matrix A and then we split it into three other matrices. So maybe let's simply call the first matrix U and the third matrix V. And then in the middle we find a reduced form of A, which I can call D, because in the best case it would be a diagonal matrix. In fact, in the case that the diagonalization of A works, we have a diagonal matrix and U and V are inverses of each other. And moreover, the generalization of that would be the so-called Jordan normal form decomposition. Again, in this case U and V are completely connected because the one matrix is the inverse of the other. And on the other hand, D is in general not a diagonal matrix, but just a Jordan normal form. So you know this was an important matrix decomposition, but we also have discussed other ones, for example the Schur decomposition. This one looks similar, but we even have a stronger connection between U and V. They are still inverses of each other, but they are also unitary matrices, so the inverse is just given by the adjoint. This makes the Schur decomposition even nicer, because it says that the two matrix A and D are unitarily similar. However, the price to pay for that is that D is in general far off from a diagonal matrix. In fact, we can only say that D is an upper triangular matrix. And exactly this we definitely want to improve in our singular value decomposition. So we want to enforce that we always have a diagonal matrix D in the middle, which means we have to weaken the connection between U and V. So we have to drop the condition that U and V are inverses of each other. And please note, this immediately means that the singular value decomposition does not give us the fact that A and D are similar matrices. However, we still want that U and V are invertible matrices, which means that A and D are definitely equivalent matrices. And moreover, it turns out that we can also keep the property of the Schur decomposition, which means that U and V can be chosen as unitary matrices. So these two things together make the singular value decomposition what it is, we transform with unitary matrices and we transform to a diagonal matrix. And since we don't have any connection between U and V anymore, we can even transform rectangular matrices. So we can simply say this works for any matrix A with M rows and N columns. So you see, this makes this decomposition very versatile because we don't need any assumption for our matrix A. Moreover, I can already tell you about the common formulation one has for the singular value decomposition because we would not write a D we would use a sigma for the diagonal matrix. And on the right, instead of V, one would write V star, which makes no difference, but it will be easier for the formulas later. So this is what you can already remember. The singular value decomposition uses a transformation with unitaries, which means we conserve lengths and angles and we go to a diagonal matrix in the end. And since we deal with rectangular matrices, Maybe a short picture here is also helpful to remember the whole formula. So on the left hand side you would find a rectangular matrix A. There we would find N columns and M rows. And now obviously on the right hand side our sigma has exactly the same form as A. And now to get the equality 
we have to put in square matrices. So we have a square matrix U of size M times M and a square matrix V star of size N times N. So with that, the matrix multiplication definitely works, but it also means that there is no connection between U and V. However, they have something in common, namely there are unitaries, which means inside the columns of each matrix we find an O and B. So for V star we find an O and B of CN, and for U we find an O and B of CM. So now the claim of the singular value decomposition is any arbitrary A can be diagonalized in this way. But maybe in the rectangular case we should clarify what it means to be diagonal. In fact, it's quite a natural definition, it just means that the upper part here is an ordinary triangular matrix. So in this case we find exactly n numbers on the diagonal and below here we only find zeros. So you could say we trivially extend our diagonal matrix. However, of course, we could also have the other case where our rectangular matrix is lying down, so it has more columns than rows. And then similarly here we would extend the diagonal matrix to the right. So in this case we would find m entries on the diagonal before everything else is zero on the right. Hence if we say diagonal, we just mean if you cut the matrix to an ordinary square matrix, you get an ordinary diagonal matrix back. So obviously this means that we bring our arbitrary matrix A into a very efficient form. In addition, also the transformation into this form is nice, because our matrices here are really easy to invert. So more precisely, we know that V star is equal to V inverse. And this implies that A and sigma are definitely equivalent matrices. So in general we don't have the similarity, but we have the equivalence of both the matrices. So this implies that both matrices represent the same abstract linear map just with respect to different bases. So we could say our abstract linear map is L and it goes from CN into CM. We already know that the columns give us the input space and the rows the output space. And now we can just state that A is the matrix representation of L with respect to the standard basis. And please note, here we have one standard basis in CN and another one in CM. And moreover, now we know that sigma is also a matrix representation, but with respect to some other O and Bs in CN and CM. And we know this representation is with respect to O and Bs, because we have unitary transformations. So inside the columns of the two matrices, we find the corresponding O and B. So we could say, the one O and B is curved V with N vectors in it. So this will be an O and B in CN. And on the other hand, we also have curved U as an O and B in CM. Okay, with this knowledge, I can give you the whole picture of this change of basis. So maybe first in the middle, we have our abstract linear map L. We will not do much with this one, but we will represent it with two different matrices. So the first thing we can do is to use our standard basis in CN and in CM. Then nothing really changes, we still get our CN and our CM on the right hand side. And then we just find the matrix representation as the matrix A on the top. Therefore more interesting is what happens here at the bottom, where we choose a different basis, one on the left and one on the right. We still get CN and CM, but now we have a different basis isomorphism between. So for example here on the left we would have our capital phi as the basis isomorphism with respect to our basis V. And the same on the right hand side here, just with respect to U. Which results in a new matrix representation, which we call sigma. So by using our standard notation, this will be a matrix where the basis V comes in and the basis U comes out. So now obviously we can always do that, we always have this picture if we have two bases V and U. Therefore now the quest for the singular value decomposition is to choose the bases in such a way that the resulting matrix representation is a diagonal matrix. 
And moreover, we are also only allowed to choose O and Bs as bases. And it turns out that we can always do that with the help of the important spectral theorem for normal matrices. In other words, the spectral theorem will help us to construct the transformation matrices we have here and there. And in fact, we already know these should be the matrices V and U. Because then the acting of the matrix A can be seen as first acting V star or V inverse, then sigma and then U. So you see, these two matrices are exactly our change of basis matrices. And now we just have to check how we can find them if we know that we want to have a matrix representation in diagonal form. And this explicit calculation for the singular value decomposition is what we will do in the next video. So I really hope we meet there again and have a nice day. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.